Thank you. I'm going to start. Everybody pay attention. Uh, can I uh, welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's 25th meeting in 2014. Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they interfere with broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent. I've got apologies from John Pentland and Graham Pearson is here as the substitute. Item one, the committee is invited to agree to consider items three, four and five in private. Item three is on approach to our budget scrutiny. Item four is our work programme. Item five is consideration of a draft report on the Criminal Justice and Courts Bill Legislative Consent Memorandum. Are you agreed to take these items in private? Thank you. Item two, child sexual exploitation. I set aside an hour for this and, and just to let the committee know they can have longer, but that's at least an hour. Um, we agreed to hold the session following a recommendation of the Public Petitions Committee on tackling child sexual exploitation in Scotland report that we undertake post-legislative scrutiny of the Protection of Children and Prevention of Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2005. The Petition Committee's concerns relate to the apparent lack of prosecutions under the uh, 2005 Act. And I welcome meeting Katrina Dalrymple, Head of Policy Division, and Stephen McGowan, Procurator of Fiscal Major Crime and Fatalities Investigation, Crown Office and Procurator of Fiscal Service, and Assistant Chief Constable Malcolm Graham, Police Scotland. I thank you for your written submissions, and you also have a written submission from Bernardo's in your papers, and have been very useful. So I'll go straight to questions from members, please. Uh, Christian, followed by Margaret. Thank you, Mr. Governor, and good morning. Uh, my first question will be... Uh, on uh, evidence we received, first of all, from Barnardos, who talked about the challenges for the need for corroboration, improving sexual uh, offences, and this evidence was corroborated by uh, the um, Crown Office and Protocol service, Fiscal Service, who said the grooming behaviour may be difficult to prove by corroborated evidence, given that it will have occurred in private. Uh, I would like uh, maybe have an answer to see uh, if you feel the main barrier uh, to uh, prosecution uh, for child sexual exploitation will be cases, will be corroboration. Yes, Mr. Rimple. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think there are many barriers. Um, so, but I do recognise that the requirement for corroboration is one of the barriers. Um, and I think this committee has heard an enormous amount of evidence about corroboration, so I certainly don't think this is necessarily the time or the place to, to, to open that debate up again. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> but um, I, I think we've made it clear in, in our written evidence that, yes, we do see that the requirement for two sources of evidence um, is sometimes um, very difficult to reach in terms of these types of offences, because, as we all know, these types of offences are committed by clever, um, by... Um, individuals who will evade detection and um, they are often committed in private and that is where the difficulty arises. Council, do you want to say something? Please point if you uh, don't have to, but if you do, that's um, Yeah, I mean, I would echo what's been said about uh, corroboration. Um, we know the challenges and, and indeed the strengths uh, that that brings to the justice system. I think that in sexual offending, and particularly where the perpetrator set out explicitly to target a vulnerability that they will design into the nature of the offending, uh, a, a minimal chance of the victim being able to provide an account uh, in a way that is likely to be to be heard, uh, then that poses multiple challenges for all the, the services that would seek to address that, uh, corroborating that account uh, in terms of getting things into the justice system is just one of those barriers, and there's many others which I'm sure we'll come on to, to speak about in more detail. Yes. Thanks very much for the answer. Another barrier might be as well um, a barrier to prosecution for grooming. Uh, we heard some, uh, there's maybe some evidence that uh, it's more the offence has been prosecuted and uh, grooming uh, uh, becomes only a narrative and evidence to support the, 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 the offence at the end. Would be the reason why grooming has not been prosecuted as much as it would have been? Yeah, um, I think what you're probably referring to is Section 1 of the 2005 Act, which I know is, is where some of the concern. Um, the, the policy behind the Section 1 of, of the 2005 Act was very clear in terms of the memorandum, and I think the Cabinet Secretary for Justice wrote um, to the committee. Um, the, the Section 1 was introduced um, for a particular reason, to kind of ensure that individuals that were, were um, 
making that online contact um, and arranging to meet. Um, there were certain... It was, it was to ensure that that was in itself criminal. There are lots of other criminal offences um, in terms of Scottish criminal law that could capture a lot of behaviours that could still be described as grooming, for example. Um, so the Section 1 was, was designed to capture a particular type of behaviour to ensure that that was made criminal. So what I would advise the committee is that there are lots of other offences that are regularly prosecuted and we regularly gain convictions in um, that do um, capture a lot of the, the type of behaviour. Yeah, obviously that from your yes, written submissions? That's right. Yes. Is it not the case that there should be some kind of consolidating legislation? Then we've got wee bits and pieces all over the place. Um, and, and why was that? That might be a ministerial thing, but it seems to me that to have this separate thing when you've got other acts, a couple of other acts, let alone the common law, the, the that it makes it complex. Um, we, well, yeah, I mean, obviously there are, there are bits of law um, all over Everywhere, the place, yes. and we have statutory and we have the common law as well. Um, so, I mean, we, we are very aware in, in the Crown Office of, of what the law is and, and how we apply it in terms of the criminal offences. The um, 2009 Sexual Offences Act, I mean, I, I, can, I can give you some, some information about that um, if required, but, uh, you know, we, we regularly uh, prosecute a lot of sexual offences yeah. under that legislation, um, and I can give you details of the ages of the victims in those types of prosecutions um, and, and, and the kind of the high level of cases that, that we can take up. So is there not an issue, therefore, about raised by my colleague that perhaps if we had a consolidating piece of legislation that it would be easier for, not necessarily inform people like yourself and the police, but other parties to understand where to look where, um, under statutory legislation, where legislation should say where crimes are being committed, that grooming should have been perhaps absorbed into the other parts. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Obviously, that's a matter for, for ministers and the government. Of course government, it is, but, but, but I, I wouldn't consolidated disagree with legislation that. would be helpful. Yes. Views as a police on that particular matter. Yeah, I mean, we've provided, uh, sorry, we've provided some information uh, about the use of Section 1 uh, and how we're using it more uh, than we did at the start. I think that's an acknowledgement that in 2005 six, when the legislation was launched, and it might be uh, perhaps uh, one of the reasons for our underuse of it initially was that it was a discrete piece of legislation. It wasn't as part of a wider act. And therefore, I would acknowledge that we didn't, uh, as, a, as a service then, and it's going back uh, some eight years, we didn't communicate that as well as we could have to our frontline officers to make sure that it was used in every circumstance where I think it could be. And that is work that we've undertaken with some pace over the course of the last year. The, the result of that uh, is that it's now been used 162 times, as you'll see in the written submission. I think what's important is the, the, the breakdown of that in terms of an analysis of uh, many of those offences gives us an indication that a substantial proportion of them are actually uh, having the intended effect of the legislation. So in a substantial proportion of those offences, they are not subsumed with another contact offence. And, and if I can make sense for you of the, the, the way it's written here and add a bit of extra detail, 58% um, of those crimes that we looked at were non-contact grooming offences. That's where somebody's contacted with the intention of meeting or arranged a meet, but they haven't yet met with the individual who's the victim. In, in the remaining 42% of the crimes, there were contact offences, but two-thirds of those, um, which I think is 28% of the total, in two-thirds of those crimes, they were uh, being charged alongside another sexual offence. In other words, the sexual contact had already been met, and, and therefore I assume, and I think very reasonably from that, that we were identifying the grooming as a result of having identified the sexual offending. Uh, and that wasn't the, the gap that the, the legislation was intended to fill, although I think it's appropriate that we use it in those cases to recognise that grooming has occurred that's led to the sexual crime. But then there are the final 14%, I think, particularly important, where uh, there has been some contact with an individual, but it's not sexual contact, mm -hmm. and we're able to evidence grooming. Uh, and again, that is what the legislation was intended to fill. So th there isn't one particular dynamic uh, that we're seeing here, but we're, we're seeing a mixture of different circumstances. And I actually think those figures provide uh, a good level of confidence that the, the gap that the legislation was intended to fill uh, is being filled 
and I don't think it was ever anticipated from my knowledge at the time of the discussion that there would be hugely significant numbers of this crime identified, uh, and therefore it's difficult to put a number on what that should be, but if we were to compare it with uh, charges that we put uh, into the Procurator Fiscal and Reports, for instance, in the 2009 Act, uh, then it's always going to be of a, of a magnitude lower, which it is. Thanks, I think the papers clarify the fact that we're not just looking at one piece of legislation where grooming comes in, we're looking at other parts in common law. Margaret, Hel but then John Finney. Margaret. Yeah, yeah just on that, I think part of the problem from um, the submissions was that if there's evidence you think of maybe a, a more substantial crime, the intercourse with an older child, um, then... You know that is the 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 charge that's gone for, and when it falls, then there's nothing much to to fall back on. So, um, I, I'm very encouraged that the 2005 Act is being used more. I, I remember being on the committee at the time. In fact, I was um, intent on bringing a member's bill on grooming, and instead this was put into the Act, and it was to cover the situation where this is happening under the wire, in the family home, child on the computer, now texting or, or whatever by mobile phone, and they're travelling to meet the intent, plus that really would hopefully be a, a preventative measure from stopping something worse happening. So I'm, I'm very uh, encouraged that it's, it's being used more and that we're raising awareness. But just on the raising of the awareness, do you now consider it's time to adapt and change the definition for CSE? To have a, a yes, please, uh, yeah. uh, Assistant Chief Constable. Yes. Um, no, I think the definition that we've got of CSE is is, is pretty clear. Um, I think that child abuse uh, is a very uh, complex area. I think that there are a, a huge number and sadly a growing number of ways in which children are abused, particularly sexually abused, across the world. As a highlight in the written submission, um, that, uh, that there are uh, growing ways in which technology is used uh, and the global reach of that continues to extend and perpetrators actively seek new ways of avoiding being detected as well. Um, I don't think that a change to the definition that we have would necessarily help uh, in any sense in protecting uh, children and young people from that harm. And I think that whilst it's always useful to have a discussion about what the, the pros and cons would be, I think we should focus on making sure that people are aware of what is uh, potentially going on out there in, in Scotland, uh, as you rightly say, in homes and in streets, uh, and raising that level of public awareness to ensure that uh, people are more attuned to the risks that children and young people face today. Uh, and that all the agencies collectively are working together to, to share information and make sure that where we do identify any concern, uh, that that's getting brought forward to the right place and acted upon. Uh, and that's everything that we've been doing since uh, since Police Scotland's been created. Just before, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rimple wants yeah, to I, as I well. just wanted to okay. read the definition because I think that speaks volumes. Any involvement of a child or young person below 18 in sexual activity for which remuneration or cash or in kind is given to the young person or a third person, the perpetrator will have the power over the child by virtue of one or more of the following age, emotional, uh, emotional maturity, uh, gender, physical strength, intellectual and economic and other resources, access to judge, etc. That's hardly user friendly and um, something that the, the public could immediately re uh, relate to and think, I've just witnessed sexual grooming or I'm just aware of. I can come back. I think uh, you know the definition is is intended for professionals uh, in terms of training and awareness. I don't think it's intended as a uh, a, a kind of public statement and a, a an easy um, sort of strap line, I suppose, for a public information campaign, which I would very very much welcome there being around about these particular issues, and and wouldn't advise that that the definition would be at the core of that. I started off by saying that child abuse takes many different forms and child sexual exploitation is only one of those forms uh, and indeed we need to be alive to all of them in the different settings in which they happen. Um, and I think that the legislation we're speaking about uh, doesn't necessarily just cover child sexual exploitation either. Some of it covers other forms of, uh, of child abuse, particularly the, the, the 2009 Act, which is, is extensive and and is the recently consolidated legislation, as members will be aware. 
Ms Dalrymple. Thank you. Um, convener, I was just going to say that one of one of the barriers that, that we have identified in, in bringing about prosecutions is that the, the child often doesn't realise what is happening to them is wrong. And, and I don't necessarily think, and I, and I agree with, with um, ACC Graham, that the definition is necessarily going going to change that. I think it is much more about education and, and public awareness in schools from a very, very early stage about this type of behaviour is wrong. And we know the types of children and the vulnerable children that are out there that are targeted. And it's about making sure that they are aware that this behaviour is wrong so that they can, we can help them to speak out. Can, can I just pick up on that? In this, particularly the re remuneration of cash and kind given to young persons. And as you say, very often they think they're in a genuine yes. relationship. Yes. It's actually grooming. Yes. So we're coming back in a full circle here. Shouldn't that be reflected in, in the definition or some kind of... Um, some way that could be referred to? I mean, I don't, I don't have a difficulty in, in terms of the definition and, and what it reflects. I think all the professionals know what we are dealing with when it comes to child sexual exploitation. Um, and I think the, mo the more important is education of, of the children themselves um, to make sure that they are aware of, of what is happening to them and that they are being exploited. Can I ask you to go back to that word you said, vulnerable? Yes. Um, particular categories which you refer to. Maybe could you, on your line of education, could you perhaps say what's done there? Children who are in care homes and so on. I mean, the example in England was a dreadful example that happened. What, what's happened on the ground there? Yeah, uh, happy, in to, happy to answer that. Um, th th there's been a growing recognition, uh, I think, of the different dynamics of child sexual exploitation over many years. Indeed, when the 2005 Act came on and, 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 uh, and was enacted, uh, the, the level of understanding about where digital technology um, would go and enable people to be contacted, contactable, to share digital imagery uh, and, and to be groomed uh, couldn't have been conceived, I think it's safe to say. In a very short space of time uh, in Scotland, uh, we've recognised that we need to go out proactively and look for this type of offending. And I think when I spoke about the figures earlier in terms of the Section 1 Act, and I would emphasise that that is a, a small portion um, of what we would use to tackle child sexual exploitation, that there's not a, a direct parallel of, of Section 1 offences and, and what we've done to tackle child sexual exploitation. But that very important 14% of children uh, or uh, yeah, of, of, of cases where um, th there had been um, non-sexual contact um, but uh, the, the grooming offence was complete. Uh, w we believe that that's as a result of our proactivity in terms of seeking out these cases and recognising that uh, we need to go looking where we think we might find it. Now, one of the ways that we can do that is by working more closely with uh, a whole range of agencies who are directly in contact with children and young people on a daily basis. So we have far closer working relationships with third sector organisations. Uh, Bernardo's being one of the key organisations, as we know, have uh, submitted information today uh, and have lobbied hard uh, to improve the responses in CSE, brought about the public petitions committee uh, that has resulted in us sitting here today uh, and as a result of that uh, along with a, a whole range of other agencies we are out on the ground educating uh, not just uh, our own police officers and staff but directing them towards the other agencies uh, and indeed the areas that we think either geographically so we know there are potentially hot spots where young people gather Could you develop that we need to be alive to that spots, please so agencies would be uh, working across the statutory sector. Local authorities clearly have a key role. Uh, they're, they, they are in the main uh, responsible for those that are looked after and in care. Uh, health services, we know that by improving our approach to identifying health issues at an early stage that might relate back to sexual abuse uh, can lead to um, investigations in child sexual exploitation. Uh, and in the third sector, uh, and I think you highlighted uh, the recent publicity that there's been following the most recent uh, inquiry, significant case review in Rotherham, uh, which comes on, on uh, the back of a long line of 
uh, similar cases in uh, large towns or cities in England and Wales, uh, where actually the, the place that this was first identified and the people that needed to be listened to were quite a small charitable organisation who were working very closely with young people uh, and we need to continue strengthening our community links uh, as a service and, and collectively into all of those bodies. The, the way in which that needs to be done uh, can be led by an organisation like Police Scotland. Uh, we have a an ability to stand up and demonstrate national leadership now that we're a national service. That's one of the strengths of the service uh, in terms of coordinating that activity across our 14 local police divisions. But primarily the responsibility for that rests with the, the devolved system that, that we have and, and that, that has many strengths in Scotland through the child protection committees uh, and the chief officer groups at a local level. But, 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 Margaret, Sorry, you no, Sandra, you want to come in there? That particular point, uh, thank you. It was just a, an experience I had when going out with the police. We went to a hotspot in Glasgow, and there was young girls there who had been drinking and were very vulnerable. And the police officers and ourselves took them home. So when they would take them home, would that automatically trigger off, you know, social services, or is that what you mean by local agencies being involved? It, it might do, and I, I couldn't comment on that specific set of circumstances, depending on the assessment. Um, but we've developed a. Uh, a national model of recording concerns. This is in the lead up to the uh, the Children and, and, and Young People Act, which will be enacted in 2016, as members will be aware. It will place a duty on the, police const uh, on the Chief Constable to, uh, to gather, collect and to share information where there are well-being concerns about young people. Now, it might be in the circumstances that you described that we actually had a child protection concern about somebody. Mm -hmm. For instance, if there was to be information alongside uh, finding young people who had been out drinking in an area of concern, if we thought that they had been at risk of actually being sexually abused, sexually assaulted, then that would be immediately dealt with as a child protection concern. Interagency procedures for that would be invoked and an investigation would be commenced. If there wasn't that type of information present and we were perhaps concerned just because they were out, um, it was late, they were in an area where we felt they could be vulnerable to exploitation, that would be a concern, that would be recorded, uh, and then that would be shared and assessed on an interagency basis um, in, in a slightly slower time fashion than if there was a child protection concern. And we have a system for doing that across the whole of the country um, with all the, the, the statutory partners that have a role in that. Thank you. Do you link in with the children's hearing system as well? Panels? Yes, yes, we when do. When there may be issues of child welfare. Absolutely, and there are yeah, there right. are statutory grounds for for referral um, that the police are, are required to refer in in certain circumstances if we think that the that the grounds for that are met, uh, and that system is being slightly redesigned to take account of the New Children and uh, Young People Act, which uh, which will deal with a lower level of concerns intervening at an earlier stage in, uh, in, in young people's lives where we think that support and assistance would be helpful uh, with the intention of preventing them from coming to some of the type of harm that we're speaking about under this legislation, which is quite clearly at the, at the higher end and we would wish to prevent. Yep, I'll take John Finney, then Roderick, then um, Elaine. Thank you, Convener. I have a few questions for me. Um, firstly, to yourself, Mr Graham, can I thank you for the very detailed response there and reassuring uh, in your response, you say this is a continuous learning and development process. Particularly, I'd like to ask you about the risk of sexual harm orders um, and the comment you make there about, um, if, I, if I may just quote, however, they do appear to have been instances where the requirement for the application within three months of the relevant conduct being reported has been a barrier to raising a barrier to progressing an application. And then you're going to say, in addition, the orders are only available for those children under 16 years of age and where potential victims are now older than 16 at the time of reporting, orders were not considered. Why isn't there that retrospective application? Surely an offence is an offence or a concern is a concern. Are you able to expand on that? I know you go on to say more. Yeah, I can do. If, if I could, Convener, before I answer that question, I'd like to make a correction uh, to the figures that were submitted, which on further scrutiny yesterday um, I realised were uh, incorrectly attributed, which gives the wrong impression of the number of live orders. So when it says in the, uh, the, the bottom paragraph of the first section round about the use of risk, risk and sexual harm orders that there are currently 23 live yes. orders, 
10 of which are interim orders. Um, what it should have said is 10 of which were interim orders, and those orders have actually lapsed, which means that there were 13 live orders in place. Now, I think the, the, the magnitude is still relatively small, um, and therefore it doesn't change the, the nature of the discussion that we're having. Uh, the difference, I should add, between the uh, the, the, if you take the 10 away, um, it, it doesn't leave 13 live orders, it leaves 11 because uh, one full order uh, has lapsed since we did that work uh, and one of the individuals with a Rosho has moved to England and Wales and therefore the record transfers with them. Um, but I just wanted that point of clarity when I had picked up the, the inaccuracy yesterday. If I could move on the to... The record transfers with them. Could you explain that? that? So, so they keep that order, that jurisdictional thing continues in England? Yes, that's right. But we, the way that we manage the, uh, the risk of sexual harm orders is the same as we manage other civil orders against sex offenders, that we record them on a national UK system called Visor, which is the uh, Violent and Sex Offenders Register. Uh, and that system allows us to proactively manage and ensure clarity of ownership uh, about the person in the police or in the criminal justice system that is taking a lead uh, for the arrangements around about any particular offender. In the main, it's used for registered sex offenders, of which there are some 4,600 in Scotland, I think 3,600 in the community, um, and the sex of offender prevention orders which uh, the Chief Constable can seek or indeed which can be sought on conviction uh, by, the, by, the, by the Crown uh, and there are some 472 of those in place across Scotland. It does put some scale in terms of the risk of sexual harm orders and, and the fact that we have a relatively low number um, of those proactively applied <coughs> for. In relation to the, the, the question round about the limitations, um, there is a, 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 a restriction within the legislation that the, uh, the conduct must have been reported uh, within three months of the application being made. Um, and I, I think the point behind the question is perhaps should that be longer? And our view would be yes, it would be helpful if it was, um, albeit we accept that, uh, that, that there may be a requirement for some limit to that, given that the legislation... Uh, prescribes the, the, the minimum length of time that the orders can be sought. Um, and the age limitation, um, I think, uh, in common with a lot of other developments in the law more recently, uh, we find that children, quite rightly, are being uh, considered as under 18 uh, and, and not under 16, and therefore there is a, there is a gap in there. I, I think the legislation does allow for uh, the case that if we identify somebody that an order would be relevant for who is age 16 or 17, um, then we can invoke child protection uh, procedures and indeed there can be a consideration uh, that the, uh, any further legislation can be on, on the schedule that would, would attribute that offence as a child protection offence, but it doesn't allow us to, to apply for the order. I have a few more questions for me. Well, just to find, you, you've got in your bit about applications, you, you know, data, data on when applications were declined at court. Would yeah. that not be useful? It, it would be useful. Um, Why can't you have that? I, I've since done a bit of work on that uh, by going and speaking to the lawyers personally, and I've discovered that out of all of the uh, risk of sexual harm orders that we have sought, none of them have gone to uh, a proof hearing. So they haven't been challenged in terms of the, the evidential basis, which is, is on the civil proof, uh, and therefore none of them have ever been uh, rejected, albeit some of the interim orders have been challenged uh, and then later revoked, but they've always been initially granted, if that's helpful. So what we're saying is that because they, these are... your you How many current live orders have you got? I've lost track. Is Eleven. It it's Eleven now. Uh, and so what you're saying is because they didn't, because they were just accepted by the party against whom the order was sought, that's why you're not able to say how many were declined because they weren't challenged. That's right. Right, so were any challenged, just interim ones were challenged? The, the only subsequently, at the point that they were uh, granted by the court, none of them went to a proof in terms okay. of a, an evidential I'm just hearing. trying to get a complete picture of appeals and so on, how much, you know, how successful the applications are under the civil burden of proof we, we and don't standard have, of proof. And, and the short answer is we don't have any experience of that at all. Right. Sorry, John. Yeah, th thank you. Um, it's to the panel generally that, that this question here, um, 
some of the evidence we have, and we have evidence from um, Children First and Bernardo's, the suggestion is that uh, almost a sense of frustration that uh, the per I wonder if there's a perceptual issue here that, just to be devil's advocate, things aren't as bad as people imagine. And it is relates, because perception does feature in people's attitudes to crimes, I'm sure Mr Graham will be aware. And I, I wonder if there's perhaps a link in with something children first say in relation to, quote, the lack of data and national reporting of statistics relevant for sexual offences, offenders, and the use of statutory powers is an ongoing concern. If anything, there's less data available than there was a few years ago. And, and a suggestion that they would welcome one national data set. I wonder if the panel could comment on that, please. I'm very much welcome that uh, one national data set. I think it's something that we have managed to improve again uh, with the creation of a national police service. We've brought together um, as best as we can with some of the IT systems that we still currently have uh, data into one place. And as an example of that, uh, to again to put some some scale on it. Uh, we know that last year there were 1,590 people uh, reported that they were raped uh, in 13, 14. Uh, they, they, they didn't report that they had all been raped during those years, so some of those were historical. But of those 1,590 crimes, about a quarter of them were against children, which I think is a really big number of children uh, reporting that they had been raped or people reporting that they had been raped as children. And I think it, it does dwarf some of the uh, the numbers that we're speaking about in this quite discreet piece of legislation. And I think if we were to, uh, to put together something that looked at all of the offences where children were the victims, whether of physical abuse, sexual abuse, child sexual exploitation, and look at that as one data set, we would all have a much clearer picture um, of all the efforts that were being taken, and indeed, most importantly, as, as, as you've highlighted, Mr Finney, where we need to continue to learn and, and to look at where the gaps are for the future. Mr Finney, it, it may assist you if, if I could quote some statistics here that I have in front of me. Um, these are convictions in terms of the 2009 Sexual Offences Scotland Act, and we've managed to break down um, the cases where um, we have had a child between the ages of 13 to 15 as the victim and where we've had a child under the age of 13. Um, and if I could just quote, for example, the last two years, um, 2012 to 13, we've had 213 convictions under the 2009 Act, and that, that encompasses all the charges under the 2009 Act. And as committee members will be aware, there are, there are a large variety of charges under that Act. Um, 213 convictions where the victim has been between the ages of 13 to 15, and 87 convictions where the child has been under 13. And in, in the last uh, financial year, 2013 to 14, there were 151 convictions um, under those charges, under those act, that Act where the child was between the ages of 13 and 15, and 57 convictions where the child was under the age of 13. And in terms of, of that year's statistics, there will probably be a significant number of, of cases still ongoing. So I think that has to be taken into consideration when you're looking at the age of the victims in terms of the Sexual Offences Act, because there are so many offences under the Sexual Offences Act that capture a lot of the behaviours that are we're talking about in terms of sexual exploitation in furtherance of sexual abuse. I can write to the committee and follow uh, up with these statistics. Figures, and also, perhaps, helpful. it would be, I don't know if you can do this, but it's very important, again, and data is important for us yes, to of see course. the whole process. How many of these were historic, if we can use that awful term, more historic cases of adults at last coming forward? Um, if that could be in there as well, We'd get a, a, a would you would that be would you, possible? Um, I don't think our database actually gives us that information, but there may be some sampling that we can do to give you yes, a flavour of that. Yes, that would be useful, I think, yes. committee yes. as well, because that's another issue about people coming forward. As you say in your papers, it takes maybe not just months but decades for some people to no, come forward right. about what's happened to them. One brief final John? question, if I may, Convener. Yeah. And it is, panel, it's about the challenge and the different roles that the agencies have. So if we have a child-centred approach, there may be instances where it's not in the child's interest to progress matters in a certain way. What reassurance can you give that a known offender or someone who clearly is an offender isn't going to slip through the cracks just because we can't? Is, is that the role of these orders, for instance, or is there... Yeah, I think, I think that's a very fair point. Um, I think that is one of the roles of the orders, which also fill quite a, a discrete gap in terms of the evidence that you would need to present for the basic criteria to be fulfilled, as you'll see from the briefings. 
there's a whole range of other things uh, that we need to do uh, more of, to be frank, uh, to make sure that perpetrators don't slip through the gap. I think one of the most important things is to challenge uh, and seek a, a wider awareness and challenge behaviours. Um, what I would have a concern about are increasingly concerning behaviours in society where uh, children and young people could be at risk because of the opportunities that that exist through digital communications and increasingly what we're picking up where uh, I think there is a, a, a growing normalisation of, for instance, sexual imagery uh, and uh, the sharing of sexual imagery and potentially young people being under pressure to, uh, to partake in that type of activity, <coughs> which can lead, in our experience, to contact offending. I think we need to be right up front about having conversations about that stuff very publicly uh, and uh, making sure that young people who are taking part in that, and it's often young people that are that are offenders as well, are aware that that is not a healthy part of a relationship. Um, it will constitute criminal behaviour. And I think the legislation is one means of intervening uh, to protect people and to ensure that perpetrators can be controlled. Um, but I think there's a far wider piece to be done in terms of education, communication, uh, and that goes not just publicly, but for all the agencies that are, that are involved in working in this area as well. Uh, and I think I've tried to articulate that in a, in a very balanced way to say that I think we've got more work to do. I think we're doing a lot, um, but I think we've got more work to do before we get there. Uh, and the problem, I think, is continuing to grow. Yes. May assist um, if, if I can uh, support um, ACC Graham in relation to that. And um, in, in terms of the use of orders, I think it's very important to note that if these orders are breached, um, the civil orders are breached, then it, it, it is a criminal offence. Mm. And as you'll note from, from the evidence that we've provided, um, since 2009, we have prosecuted um, 37 breaches of risk of sexual harm orders. And there's actually only been 31 orders in, in place, so that means that. The, an order has been breached more than once and we have robustly prosecuted them. Thank you. Uh, uh, my, my question was, sorry, and I probably didn't frame it right, it was more, more on the, the joint investigation where you perhaps have a police officer and a social worker who will have shared interests, but they will also have unique interests to their professions. Um, and, and there is, I think, historically been a tension there. And how, how that's addressed, <coughs> if it's ultimately deemed not in the child's interest to proceed formally with prosecution and ensuring that any perpetrator is somehow swept up in that? Well, I think the orders have got a part to play in that. Um, and, and I would like to see uh, us pushing the boundaries of where we can get orders. I would like to see them tested in the court um, to see the, the, the limits of the legislation used uh, with the intention of making sure that children are protected where we have that information. Um, and we have some plans developing to, to coordinate that nationally so that we can pick up and highlight the cases where that might be applicable so that um, if we do set out, as I think you're inferring, the police will always set out to gather evidence to the standard of proof that we can uh, expect it to go into a criminal court. We don't seek to gather evidence on the, uh, on the premise that we're going to seek a civil order. It's not largely within the mindset of how the police operate. So we need to make a bit of a shift there to make sure that it's seen as being a viable alternative if we're not going to get a sufficiency of evidence to uh, make a report to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. But, but I would emphasise that the, 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 the line between the two is quite a fine one because you still need to, to be able to evidence... Uh, albeit to a different burden of proof, that uh, somebody has contacted somebody on two occasions and that they've done it uh, with the intention um, of uh, what, what, what's classed as sexualised uh, activity, I think. So, you know, that, that that's quite a fine difference. Uh, and then when I, I talked about all the other things, and, and, and apologies if I did that at some length in answering the question, I, I actually think that uh, the most effective way of protecting children, we do have a shared interest with, uh, with social services and all the other agencies, and ensuring that the, 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 the interests of the child come first. I do think that uh, in, the, in the medium and longer term, the most effective way of doing that is to influence the behaviour of the perpetrators. We need to make sure that the responsibility rests firmly with them for committing these offences, whilst we do everything that we can to protect young children. Um, but I think an awful lot of the debate at the moment, uh, publicly, as we've seen over the course of the last year, 
has focused on uh, victims, victimisation and identifying victims. Uh, you know, the police are really interested in identifying the perpetrators and bringing them to account, making sure that they are held responsible and trying to prevent more people from becoming offenders. Okay, thank you. That's very sure. Thank you. I've got quite a list, so if I move on, I've got Elaine followed by Alison followed by... Oh, sorry, I've got Roderick and then I've got Elaine followed by Alison followed by Graham. Thank you, convener. Don't take that um, personally. No, I, won't, I just don't didn't have my glasses on. Um, uh, a lot of the, the points I was going to raise have been covered, but if I can, um, reference has been made already to the Rotherham inquiry. Um, I'd just uh, like to make reference to some remarks that Professor Jay made uh, to Holyrood magazine, um, uh, where she's quoted as saying, I don't know the situation in Scotland, I hesitate to be critical, but it's an interesting phenomenon. I don't believe low levels of conviction mean low levels of crime, she says, albeit holding out hope that recent victim and witness legislation might provide better protection and support for vulnerable young people going through the court process. Just wondered um, if anyone would like to comment on that. I think it's undoubtedly true that, that low levels of conviction doesn't necessarily mean that there's a low level of CSE and, and we, the committee asked about data sets. It's vital that we do have more data about this. The new legislation certainly will assist us in helping victims through the court process. It assists in breaking down some of those barriers. I think there's a legitimate question that Professor Jay asks about whether what that means and what the number of convictions means for the rate of child sexual exploitation. Um, there is probably no correlation between the number of convictions and the, and the amount of child sexual exploitation. We don't have the data at the moment to look at that. since her report came out um, because clearly we want to get as uh, in-depth an understanding as we can um, of what she uncovered and then tried to put that into the context of what's happening in Scotland given her um, extensive experience uh, and in-depth understanding of how the Scottish system works and I think she's acknowledged um, that firstly the relationship between the police and the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service is very different than the relationship between the police and the CPS in, in England and Wales which might uh, answer in part some of that question. But I think the, the fundamental point uh, is that, uh, you know, no, we can't be reassured that this isn't going on um, just because there isn't prima facie evidence of it being reported to us. Uh, we're increasingly aware of that, that this is an area that we will only find when we proactively go looking for it. And we have been proactively looking for it and, and a number of operations that are in progress. Uh, which have been uh, in the public domain uh, to a greater or lesser extent uh, because of the interagency activity uh, that has led to them. Uh, and, and whilst I can't give um, precise details as some of the prosecutions are, are still in progress, some of that ongoing activity is evidence of the increasingly proactive approach that we are taking. The, the other question, and, and, and I hope it's helpful um, to, to, to sort of relay this, I've been asked a lot uh, in the position I'm in since Rotherham's come out, well, is Rotherham happening in Scotland? And, and it's the appealing question to ask uh, and understand that um, by, by colleagues, um, by uh, leaders in, in other partnership organisations uh, and, and indeed by elected members. I suppose the answer that I give to that is, well, it depends what you mean by Rotherham. Um, because th there was a very strong, uh, and I think it goes beyond inference in the report, that there was a clear history, it describes a journey uh, of members of Reddit, quite a, a troubling um, and, and traumatic journey for the, for the reader, never mind for those that were um, experiencing uh, the victimisation and the abuse that is so eloquently described uh, in, in a concise report that covers a lot of ground. I think it's very clear, though, that um, there was such a large amount of information about the scale and prevalence of what was going on in Rotherham that so many people knew about. <coughs> and the inference in the report is that there was active efforts for a long period of time uh, to, to suppress that. Uh, and if the question is, is that happening in Scotland? Absolutely <coughs> not. Um, there's, there's absolutely nothing that's come to my attention uh, of any uh, large scale or extensive um, coordinated group who are conducting child sexual exploitation on the scale that was described in that report uh, and if it w if there had been uh, then we would be conducting investigations into it 
However, if the question is, is there child sexual exploitation in Scotland uh, and in the towns and cities uh, and, and indeed the rural areas of Scotland, the answer is yes. We know there is because uh, we're investigating it. We're investigating it successfully in many cases uh, and we're increasingly understanding that the way to approach these investigations is by working more closely in partnership from the outset making sure that there is strong, a consistent and effective support in place for the victims to allow them to be able to understand uh, and provide an account of what has happened to them uh, with the hope and expectation that we can bring that into the justice system. Uh, but the primary focus has to lay uh, in the interests of the child. And w one of the operations that's ongoing um, that, that I spoke about is, is an example of that. It's Operation Dash. It's a widespread operation focusing on uh, a premise of child sexual exploitation in the west of Scotland. Uh, and there are now 55 crimes uh, that have been recorded in relation to that, uh, that operation against, uh, I think, 22 different accused persons. Uh, a large number of reports, um, been, I think 23 reports, been submitted to the Crown Office Procurator <coughs> Fiscal Service, and some of those cases are in train. Some of them res have resulted, I think I mentioned in my evidence, that one of them is due to be sentenced tomorrow, includes a uh, Section 1 grooming offence, the other charges that are being preferred, um, there are nine rape charges, uh, there are five other sexual assault uh, charges, there are various um, sexual coercion charges, all um, sexually related, um, and there are various other non-sexual um, but violence-related offences as well. As I say, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to go into more detail about those cases which will, will unfold on a case-by-case on -case basis, but I think it's important to highlight the, uh, the strength of the, the efforts that have gone into tackling uh, and I don't think the committee would received. expect you to go into your operational methods either because you'd be disclosing them to people listening to this committee who would simply then say, well, that's what you're up to now, I know what to do differently or something. We appreciate that. Could Mr. Rimple wants to come in. As Thank well. you. No, it, it was just um, we, the, the Crown have also met with, with Professor G, and one of the, the, the lessons learnt um, from Professor G report, and one of the things that she identified was the approach to decision making by prosecutors um, down south. Um, and I just wanted to reassure the committee, and I'm, I'm quite sure the Lord Advocate said the same when, when he was here previously, is that the approach to making a decision in these cases is entirely different. Um, historically, down south, um, the approach to decision making was looking at the credibility of the victim. Um, we, we will obviously um, you know, take the credibility of the victim into consideration, but we look at the credibility of the allegation we look at the allegation that has made and we look at what supporting evidence there is to support that. Now, the victim's credibility will be one part of that, of course, but we absolutely recognise that there will be occasions when victims will not tell us the truth for very, very sound reasons because they are scared. Um, and we've actually further developed, and maybe Stephen may want to, to explain further, um, a bespoke victim strategy in, in all high court uh, cases where there's serious sexual offending, um, which is bespoke individual victim strategy. I don't know whether you want to say anything about that. The, the victim strategy is something that we've introduced uh, in the spring of this year. And really what that does is it looks at the victim and looks at what support that victim as an individual person needs going through the process of investigation and prosecution. So at the same stage as the evidence is gathered and decisions are being made about the evidence in that case, we look at the victim and we look at the victim as a person, what level of information they need about the case, what their background is and how they are supported throughout the whole process. All of that is done with a view to having a very early meeting with them to explore that, to tell them what we can do, to tell them signpost them in the direction of other people that can assist them. And all of it's about managing the, the experience of the victim through the criminal justice system. It's done in every sexual offence, but there's a particular focus on it with the additional vulnerabilities you have over any complaint on a sexual case that you would have in relation to a victim of child sexual exploitation, who we know ha have some of the most complex needs out of any people that we will deal with in the criminal justice system. So that's something that we introduced recently. It's all been managed through our National Sexual Crimes Unit, which, as the committee will be aware, was the first unit of its kind which was introduced uh, in, in Europe. We introduced it in Scotland in 2009. And we've got a network of sexual offences teams throughout the country who are involved in local liaison with the police uh, and bringing those cases to the Specialist Crown Council at NSCU to make the decisions. Uh, interesting for the committee to note that um, the, 
volume of sexual offences that we deal with, generally speaking, has increased recently, uh, and a substantial proportion of that is offences against children. So of our 36 advocate deputies, 20 of them are now based in the National Crime, Sexual Crimes Unit and 20 are specialist sexual crimes prosecutors. So there's been additional resource put into that area of our business as well to improve the way we take those cases forward. That, that's um, very helpful. Uh, I've got one small further question. Before I do, I just, just wanted to refer to the executive summary uh, that Professor Jay put out in terms of Rotherham when she commented on changes between 2009 and 13, and said, the police are now well resourced for child sexual ex exploitation and well trained, though prosecutions remain low in number. So that's an indication of the complexity of some of these issues. But I could just ask uh, ACC um, Malcolm Graham, uh, Slightly confused in your submission as to what was actually meant by the strategic analytical profile. Um, perhaps you could give us a bit more information on that and how that's been developed and how that's going to assist. Okay. Um, that's uh, a piece of work which uh, will be driven by um, all of the intelligence and information sources that Police Scotland can gather together. Uh, and it comes directly from a recommendation uh, that was made uh, following the Public Petitions Committee report, um, where they were of the view, I think quite rightly, and, and, and this is where Professor Jay starts her report as well, I think, by saying nobody will know what the, the true scale of child sexual exploitation in Rotherham was or is. Uh, I think that's true in Scotland, uh, and the recommendation from the Petitions Committee was that there should be an assessment, um, a strate strategic analysis of the information that is held. Uh, we've conducted that, um, and the report um, is a restricted document uh, in terms of the information that it holds, in terms of the, uh, the data sources that it's drawn from. Um, it looks at all the areas that we've discussed this morning. Um, but I think the, the, the sum total of the findings in it for me are that it will only tell us what we already know. Uh, and actually, it doesn't give us a, a representation of the true scale of the problem. In advance of the, uh, the ministerial working group around child sexual exploitation, the Scottish Government uh, commissioned Bedfordshire University to do a study. They are known as being uh, a leader uh, in this particular field uh, in terms of academic research. Uh, and they came to a similar, similar conclusion, uh, which uh, I, I wouldn't say characterises all academic research, but the, the, the final part was certainly more research needs to be done to, to accurately establish the the scale of the problem. I, I think that I go back to comments I made previously that w w we will always underestimate the scale of the problem if we only use the data that we hold, because we know that we don't hold data about everything that's going on. I, I can give you an example from the wider sexual offences where the best assessment we have from Scottish Crime Survey data is that uh, probably about 20% of serious sexual crimes are reported to the police. And uh, as I said earlier, 1,590 rapes recorded across Scotland last year. And the best assessment from independent survey data is that, is that that's 20% um, of, of the crimes that, that have happened then I think we have to acknowledge we're never going to know what the true scale of it is. And whilst we need to increasingly uh, work together so that the, the likes of the strategic analysis that we've done um, in, in the police, and it does draw on data from, from the third sector and from other statutes agencies where it's available, I think we have to continue developing that. And one way of continuing to develop that would be to to work with the government and the other agencies in a more coherent fashion, and we're working towards that at the moment, um, to join up all the information that everybody holds, um, but I still don't think it'll ever give us a complete picture of what we're dealing with, and we need to get on with the action that addresses the problem uh, in that knowledge. Thank you. Can I, can I just add a really stupid question? If 20% only reported to police, how do you know there's 80 how do you know it's 20 per cent? Yeah, that, that comes from the... So it, it, it's independent. It's the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey, um, which I think came out in July this year, comes out uh, every two years, I think, now. Uh, and they survey a statistically valid uh, number of people from across Scotland about their experience of crime and justice in a way that you could never um, attribute an accuracy towards from the amount of crime that is recorded by the police. I think it's widely acknowledged that 
crime recording figures only give you a picture of what's reported. I understand that, but so it's a random sample of people? I don't think it's random. I think the approach people... I'm, I'm, I'm getting slightly into territory that I'm not an expert uh, enough Heath, to say I don't, in terms does of Does anybody uh, help me with that? I don't survey. know how you know this 20%. Well, I, I think it's the, the, I the approach... Pardon, excuse me, I'm being helped. Sorry. No, no, I just think the Scottish Grand Justice Service, I believe, it's just supposed to be a, a representative cross-section. So yeah, it is a representative cross-section. So. What I call ran random so that people... Yeah. Well, your experiences, and from that you're able to say... 80% don't tell us. That's what the survey says. Okay. Um, they, they've, they've developed specific modules around about uh, sexual offending, and it includes uh, different age strata within it. Um, okay. I don't have it in front of me, so I'm no, quoting just, from memory. No, I just wondered but... and, you know, take myself where I didn't want to go, but there we are. Um, but that was helpful. Um, finish, Roddy, have you? Yes, thank you for helping yeah. me out as well. Elaine, followed by Alison, followed by Graham, followed by Sandra. Uh, I, I was quite um, struck by... ACC Graham's evidence on the risk of sexual harm orders, and particularly the point that he makes that at the moment there has to be at least two occasions where uh, an activity has taken place which can lead to a civil order uh, being imposed on the individual. Is there, uh, ACC Graham argues that that should be reduced to one. Is there actually any argument to say that one should not be enough, particularly given it's not actually triggering the criminal prosecution at that point? Well, I, I don't think there is. I mean, I think in the vast majority of cases where uh, we identify that there's been a sexual contact, to be in the position of saying, right, we'll have to wait for another mm -hmm. um, and see if that happens before we can apply for an order um, is, is bizarre. And in many cases where we're able to identify two forms of sexual contact, it's going to constitute an offence that we would uh, that we would report in any case rather than going for an order. So that's why I say there's quite a discrete band of circumstances in which we would be applying for the order where we wouldn't be looking um, to report to the Crown. Now, I should say what I would like to see uh, are more circumstances where we are applying for risk of sexual harm orders alongside reporting information to the Crown and, and using the, uh, the, the, the civil orders more proactively in that manner. And we've got plans to do that, but uh, that hasn't come through in the figures yet. My other question really was around the issues about education and particularly given the exposure of young people to pornography and other uh, aberrant forms of sexual behaviour online, which they can obviously clearly feel are normal uh, if they don't have the appropriate forms of education. I mean, I don't want to stray onto another petition, which has had a, uh, a lot of a, a bit of publicity recently. But uh, in your view, is the education offered to young people sufficient nowadays to address that sort of problem and to enable those who might perpetrate that sort of behaviour to realise that it's an offence and indeed to allow people who are potentially victims, the confidence to say that I'm not that we can refuse this type of behaviour or this type of approach? I think more needs to be done uh, to assess the, the impact and, and the scale of the problem round about new sort of digital technologies, which in the main, if I'm being frank, the people that are making the decisions about the policy and the laws are not actively using on a daily basis. And I, I put myself into that category as well. To get yourself into the mindset of what it feels like uh, to be uh, and, and I say from personal experience, I'm not talking about 13, 14-year-olds. Mm. I'm talking about 8, 9, 10-year-olds mm. who have probably got a fairly active uh, digital presence in terms of living their lives through some sort of virtual or online community in a way that many of us certainly mm. uh, could never have conceived of in our childhood uh, and, and probably have some difficulty, I, I speak from personal experience, uh, identifying with um, in adulthood. And therefore... Education has to be at the heart of making sure people understand what is and isn't acceptable and healthy. And I think there's huge opportunity for that not to be the case uh, from everything that, that we see. I, I would focus my attention in relation to today's questions back to child sexual exploitation. I think there's a specific role for education authorities in identifying and picking up that uh, children who are at school are uh, likely um, to be exposed in some way uh, mm -hmm. to something during the course of their school life that, uh, that could lead to this type of behaviour. Uh, and I think we need to make them aware of that, the, the children and young people. But I think we need to make the, the schools more aware of that as well, make sure that teachers and staff are, are, are key as being 
uh, well informed uh, about what's happening. Uh, and I think that was laid out in Rotherham, actually, mm. very starkly in, in the report, which struck me that there was a number of instances where young girls who were being abused were being picked up by taxis from the school gates um, mm. to perform sexual acts on some of the perpetrators and then returned at the end of, uh, of lunchtime. I mean, that's a, that's a particularly... Sort of traumatic account of 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 somebody's school day uh, and the fact that that wasn't picked up and, and acted upon timelessly by education authorities. Now I'm I'm not saying there's any experience of that in Scotland, um, but I, but I think it's a, a salutary tale that we should never be complacent uh, about the potential for 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 people who are at school being targeted. That you? That's you. Thank you, um, Alison. Followed by Graham. Followed Thank by. You. Sandra. Thank you. Um, Ms. Dalrymple said when responding, I think, to Margaret Mitchell that we all know what we're dealing with um, as professionals when you said you were, what, what, what constituted grooming and what uh, um, child sexual exploitation was. Um, but one of the saddest things about the Rotherham Inquiry um, findings were that um, the police considered the children as young as 11 as being consenting. Um, to sexual behaviour, and, and we heard um, read evidence of the police considering the girls to be uh, undesirables and not worthy of protection. I mean, that's one of the most appalling things that has come out of the findings. So, girls that were most vulnerable not being given that protection. Um, ACC Graham, you say in your report to us, your written evidence to us, that you have um, tried to embed the understanding of, of CSE within the force. Can you give me um, a greater understanding of the extent to which um, there is still learning to be done in the force? Okay, well, I, I'll cover a bit what, what we have done. Um, we, we've embedded uh, that requirement to reassure ourselves that any of the culture um, that you've highlighted that uh, Professor Jay highlighted in her report, and, and, and much of it did go back um, to an earlier period uh, during that journey between 1997 and 2013 that the report covered, um, and, I, and I think she acknowledges in her report that that behaviour in, in South Yorkshire police um, was quite clearly lo no longer evident, and it was a, as a result of action they'd taken. Um, what, what we've done is embedded that culture change coming from the, the, the whole ethics and values that the service is based on, uh, that, that Police Scotland was founded upon and, and building on uh, the, the, the ethics and values of the police service through every strand of training um, for frontline officers when they enter the organisation, so into probationary training, into specialist detective training, who are likely to be the people that are uh, conducting these investigations uh, in different roles, uh, and by making sure that through the senior management um, there's a high level of awareness uh, of the issues uh, that need to be tackled, uh, and the leadership that needs to be shown throughout the organisation to ensure that people are well attuned and picking up to um, any aberration from the, the culture that quite rightly we expect, where every young person um, is, is recognised and valued uh, as an individual, uh, and there isn't any um, attribution to their worth in the way that you've described um, because of the circumstances they find themselves in, uh, and indeed that every uh, investigation is dealt with uh, in a fair and appropriate manner to make sure that we do everything we can to uh, to bring any perpetrators to justice. And quite clearly that was not always the case um, from the report uh, that you've described uh, in South Yorkshire. Uh, and I'm very clear now that if we find any circumstances where that's not the case in Scotland, it would be dealt with uh, very robustly. That's, that's, that's reassuring. Um, on a separate question, if I might just ask, um, one of the other things that was highlighted in the Rotherham inquiry was um, children absconding from care, um, being basically escorted back to care without any kind of um, interview or understanding as to what was going on. Can you explain what processes happen if you're involved in taking children back who have absconded? Yeah, we've, um, we've done a huge amount of work around about uh, missing person inquiries. We, we started that off um, by getting a better understanding of what was happening across Scotland. Uh, so we did, uh, to, to go back to the question from Mr Campbell, a uh, strategic analysis uh, of the data that we held about people that were missing, not just young people, 
Um, and, and perhaps not surprisingly, what that flagged up was that the most frequently identified locations for people to go missing from in each of the 14 local policing divisions were a combination of uh, hospitals and care homes for young people. Um, not normally, uh, both of those featuring heavily in, in the top 10 sites. Each of the local policing divisions now has a plan um, to engage and work with those institutions to look at understanding better why people go missing, to try and reduce the number of instances that people go missing. And most importantly, when they do, we've now got a robust policy around about return interviews, how they must be conducted by the police, how they must then be communicated with the people who are either parents uh, or in uh, many cases of vulnerability uh, carers of the young people who have gone missing in instances like this to make sure that uh, we get all the information that we need uh, that would flag up if there's a concern. Now, that doesn't mean that we just stop because we have an expectation that young people are, are going to provide an account that they're being sexually exploited because they've gone missing uh, on frequent occasions. In fact, we know it's highly unlikely that that will be the case, but it gives us a far better sense of what's happening in that young person's life that the police are most likely uh, to get at that point that we can then share with all the other agencies um, who can provide the support uh, and, and hopefully um, lead to either protecting that young person uh, if they are at harm and making sure that if there's information that would lead to a, a criminal investigation that that will come to the police. And perhaps on that returning interview, um, do you think that you could work closely with, with the third, third sector, perhaps say Bernardo's, um, to, to, to provide a, a more supportive environment where the children might open up a bit more about what's happened? Yeah, I think it's one area that uh, that we're looking actively at, um, and, and again came from the, the work of the Public Petitions Committee and indeed from the uh, quite, quite rightly proactive work um, of a number of charities working in this area to, to highlight the role that, that they can play. Um, you know, the police uh, have got a wide-ranging remit uh, in terms of protecting people, keeping people safe, um, investigating crime. But I also understand uh, from my experience uh, as a police officer over many years that we're not always the agency that young people are most likely to feel that they want to share uh, some very private, confidential and, and, and challenging information to, to pass across to. So we need to make sure that we're working most closely with the people that we think are likely to be uh, most close to those young people. Um, and we're in discussions about a number of different ways of doing that locally um, and perhaps nationally as well. Miss McGowan. Miss Dalrymple, sorry. Oh, Miss McGowan. Go back to your first question. <laughs> no wonder you're blushing. <laughs> um, the, the, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service have recently um, set up an independent scrutiny panel um, and the first um, function that we have been looking at has been domestic and sexual abuse um, across the organisation. Now this scrutiny panel, um, we have invited um, I think about nine or ten of our critical friends as we like to call them from the third sector um, and we have police and government as well. And the cases have been selected at random and we have cases where we have taken prosecutions and cases where we have not taken prosecutions but there perhaps has been a detailed investigation and we've concluded that there's been insufficient evidence. At the last panel we considered four cases, uh, two domestic and, and two of a sexual nature, one of a sexual case of, of, of rape where we were unable to take proceedings and we opened up our files to the third sector no holds barred. They, they saw everything. Um, they saw the, the police report, they saw our precognitions, they saw our analysis, they saw all the evidence um, that we had collated in the investigation. And the, the purpose of these panels is exactly what you see. If there were attitudes that were within the fiscal service or in the police that were being displayed, then our critical friends should pick up on these. Um, I'm glad to say that, 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 that there weren't, um, but I recognise that obviously we are, we are looking at, at a sample. Our purpose in these scrutiny panels is to make sure that we test our own policies. We don't want to make assumptions that we know all the time what's best. We want to make sure that we rely on our third sector 
um, and that they tell us because we recognise that they are at the front line and they are dealing with these people that come into contact with the criminal justice system. So the panel uh, will make recommendations which will go to law officers and the law officers from the recent panel have agreed with all the recommendations and we will report back to the next panel. Um, just, I recently met with Bernardo's and we invited Bernardo's on to the next panel um, to make sure and we will ensure that on our next panel we deal with a sexual case involving the child victim. That's in passing, do you, as one of the agencies, you deal with the care inspectorate at all um, in dealing with care homes for, for young people? We, we, we haven't got the care inspectorate on our review panel, but that's something I'm that we can certainly look at. I'm actually the police there at. at the time, I think, to ask Sorry. if... They, no, it's fine. I just wondered if the care inspectorate had a role there, given that we were talking about a home in um, England that was, uh, you know, put it mildly, not properly managed. So let's just look at... Do, do you deal with the care inspectorate at all? If they we have, do. Thank you. We That's work, all I wanted to we, know. We work very closely with the care inspector in terms of uh, developing their inspection regime. I think yes. it's a very interesting point about uh, playing it back to the Rotherham as well, because I think uh, the, the the point that comes out of the report, uh, the, the observation I would make anyway, is that there was a large amount of inspection and scrutiny activity over what was happening in Rotherham over many years. It's laid out in a timeline in the report, which is quite stark when you read it, that people um, not only sought, but they took reassurance <coughs> from the reports yeah. that were being conducted. And therefore, I think it's a role for all of us to be challenging uh, in terms of the, the effectiveness of the scrutiny and the inspect uh, inspection regimes that we have in place to make sure that they are. I know as a result of that, the care inspector that sit on the Scottish Government-led ministerial working group into child sexual exploitation. Right action plan from which uh, the, the, the police uh, and, and all the other agencies around the table have uh, have developed uh, and, and will be uh, being launched soon. Uh, and the care inspector, uh, as a result of their learning from that and everything else that's going on, have introduced a specific module uh, in their inspections right. already into child sexual exploitation. And this is the children's services inspection that they are doing in each of the local authorities area uh, and I have asked for a summary as quickly as possible from their findings in each local authority area um, of any common themes that are emerging so that we can make sure we're picking up on the learning. So I think they're alive to the, the, the That's the very point. helpful about, um, I hope, a tighter um, inspection regime. Um, Graeme, please, Thank followed you. by Sandra. Thank you. Um, I think the um, outline that Mr Rimpel gave about the Crown Office opening files in the way that she described is likely to be unprecedented and I think is uh, to be welcomed. In that light, Mr Graham, you mentioned the restricted document that had been created in terms of the strategic assessment. Is that document shared with your partner agencies and uh, do they feed into that document uh, after they've read it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a, a very good point. Um, and I think I covered it when I described it in relation to Mr Campbell's question, uh, that at the moment, uh, not as much as I would like. Um, I think that we need to get uh, a greater level of cooperation into that document. In fact, I would like to see it led um, by, by the Scottish Government as a piece of work that we could all feed into uh, equally. Um, but, but I think quite rightly the, uh, the Public Petitions Committee recommendation was that the, the police should start by analysing all the information that mm. they hold and anything else that we can access. Mm. I don't think we've accessed everything that we can from across the third sector. I think the areas that are perhaps most important are those that might be hardest for us to reach. Uh, they'll be held by perhaps a, a small service or a small mm. agency in a, in a local area that's got a very good mm. relationship with young people. Uh, and I need to make sure that, that their voice can be heard um, at a national level. And then in terms of sharing the results of that uh, in the format it's in, uh, as you'll understand, uh, with the, the level of detail and, and attribution, no. But I think down the line I would like to produce something um, that's a public document that gives a, an assessment of the scale and nature uh, and hopefully uh, confidence and reassurance that we're uh, serious in tackling the problem and trying to get a better understanding. But in that environment that the Crown Office described, do you think it's feasible as an action point that that strategic assessment would be shared in that kind of forum? Oh, absolutely. Here on in? Absolutely, Thank you. yes. Second point, before I come to the more substantial question, about IT links and the ability to collect information, not only within the service but across the agencies. Mm -hmm. Are you confident that we have the kind of IT collection processes which advises 
and, and gives the kind of knowledge that's necessary for decisions to be taken. Yeah, I think uh, that, as ever, is a, is a strengthening picture. Um, we have introduced a vulnerable persons database with that very purpose in mind, uh, as the committee might be aware. Uh, we did that very old and clunky system. Um, but do you feel currently you're in a fit state to properly access the kind of knowledge and intelligence and facts I, I, that are necessary? I, if I could return to the, the vulnerable persons database as a, as a new system, it's, it's an interim system that was, was designed within Police Scotland, uh, it was launched after the inception of Police Scotland, um, and uh, I, I don't think it is an old and clunky system. I think it's a system that, uh, across the whole of the country, gathers information about a whole range of vulnerabilities and causes the police to be able to link different vulnerabilities between children and adults, whether it's coming from domestic abuse, child protection, concerns about a child which might not uh, reach the level of, of some statutory means of intervention for, for protection, hate crime, uh, missing persons, uh, as, a, as I've already mentioned, uh, and, and youth offending as well, which can be a, a sign um, of a young person in trouble for a whole lot of different reasons that we need to look behind. Uh, that system is, uh, is up and running uh, across the whole of Scotland. Um, it is allowing Police Scotland to uh, understand when people move from one area to another within the country, which is absolutely vital. Uh, and it's allowing us to develop protocols in each of the local areas that we work in uh, with whatever information sharing systems there are. So it isn't joined in uh, in a strategic sense to a national system beyond the police, um, but there isn't a national system that exists uh, within local mm -hmm. authorities or, uh, or, or health care that we could plug into for that reason. The, the next stage uh, of that system will be under the I6 programme, where there will be a vulnerable persons module. Um, that will build on the learning of the interim vulnerable persons database that we've uh, that we've developed, and, and I actually think it's a uh, a fantastic credit to the people that have worked on it and a real success that so we've got it up and running, uh, and that we're gathering that information, uh, we're sharing it, and I think it puts the police in a strong position uh, to, to 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 understand what we know across the whole of the country in a way that we never could have conceived of doing uh, before Police Scotland was created. And my final question, the stats that you gave us earlier, uh, outlining possibly up to 400 um, child rapes a year being reported, mm -hmm. and, and you acknowledge that that may only be 20% of, of the actuality, do you feel that uh, with the 4,600 sex offenders that are known to us in the system, that MAPA uh, currently is uh, fit for purpose would you welcome a review of MAPA arrangements to see if they can be upgraded and, and refreshed? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, again, it's a very current question. Um, the care inspectorate are launching uh, an inspection of uh, MAPA arrangements across the country. Uh, they'll be supported by HMIC, and, and we're working closely with inspection agencies uh, to, to shape what that uh, inspection should look like and, and ensure that the, the scrutiny is put in place over the effectiveness of the arrangements. I, I think the current position that we're in um, it is again continually evolving. I, I think it is largely effective. I think that uh, the, the legislation is effective and uh, the nature of the interagency working uh, is leading to a lot of people being protected. It's very difficult to attribute a figure to that. Um, but I think the scale of the issue, 3,600 sex offenders in the community in Scotland, 472 uh, prevention orders being actively policed uh, across the country um, gives members some uh, measure uh, of the, the nature of the, the scale of the resource that's put towards that across Scotland. Um, and, and I think it's having a really positive effect. Mm -hmm. But I was asking your own personal opinion on the basis of your experience. Would you welcome the review of MAPA and would you like to see it refreshed for the challenges that are now being identified? I think I'd like to wait uh, the outcome of the inspection uh, to see what the findings of that are. Um, I think at the moment I'm very satisfied that uh, we're working well in partnership and it's having a positive effect. Thanks, you, and that figure of 3,600 sex offenders is huge. Could, perhaps you could clarify what that is, what that range that covers a sex offender. Is that everybody in the sex offenders register? So everybody, or is that serious? You know, I'm just trying to get a grasp of it. 
I think uh, well, I'd probably give you the precise figures uh, would be more helpful. Everybody that's in the um, on the sex offender register, so somebody that's committed an offence that's been required to register since uh, the Act in 1998. Uh, and who hasn't uh, come off the register. So uh, the, the scale of that is always growing because quite a proportion of people who are required to register are required to register for life, so they never come off. Uh, so that 4,600 number um, is 4, all 4,600, sorry, it's 4,000. That, 4, that right, is yeah. the total number, um, but there are uh, 3,600 of those who are uh, in the community. Uh, and those are rough figures. I, I do have the exact figures here, um, if I can find the right page. I think people would be frightened to hear 3,600 sex offenders are out there. And I know, so I, I'm trying to get clarification as what that actually means when you say 472 prevention orders, so we get a, a perspective on it. Yeah, so, so I found the page. So there, there are 4,650 people that have been required to register yes. um, on the the sex offenders register under the legislation. 3,604 of those are currently in the community, 1,046 in custody still. And we have 472 live sex offender prevention orders, which is a civil order that the police can apply for or indeed can be applied at the point of conviction, which uh, prohibits a uh, registered sex offender from carrying out a certain course of conduct or requires them to, to, to do something. So it might uh, prevent somebody from entering a certain area, it might prevent them from approaching a certain person, uh, and then we can police that and, and a breach of that order, uh, although it's a civil order, as a criminal offence as well, it would be reported to the Crown. It's a means of um, controlling uh, somebody who you know poses a higher risk than uh, many of the sex offenders who are managed in the community actively. And all of this information is already in the public domain through the annual MAPA reporting, maybe not as currently as this. Um, I don't think anybody reads that. that. I just think if you were listening to the committee and you had 3,600 sex offenders out there, you might think, uh, and I'm not diminishing <laughs> sex offenders, that there are 3,600 rapists out there or serious sexual assaults out there. I'm asking for clarification what that That's, actually means. It's the, it's, sorry, it's the full range of the legislation that would be encompassed by uh, the Act that would require somebody to, to register. Um, somebody from the Crown might be better able to, to, to give the details of that. Any offence where there's a sub substantial sexual element, so it would go from rape to breach of the peace where there's a substantial right. sexual element. That's just crime. what I'm so it's, it's, a whole, yes. it's the whole range of potential offences yes. with a sexual element to yeah. them. I understand that. Just trying to get that on the record, what it actually means across the range of things. I um, don't know if that's helped me particularly, but I think 3,000 you know, was quite startling if you were just listening to this, thinking you know, there's all these very serious sex offenders out there. I mean, sex offenders bad anyway, but if, you know, depending on the, the, the range that's out there. Is there any way of clarifying what that range is, if you're saying, you've just said 3,600, how would we clarify the various categories? Where would you find that? I'd have to go away and look at that. You have to go away and look at it, but I think it'd be useful. Sandra. Very much, convener. I think if I need to remember, if I want to ask a supplementary, then uh, unfortunately you get put down to the very bottom of the list. But oh I shall God. certainly remember that anyway. Sure, no, you, no, if fine. you're going to be peaked like that, no, you might no, slip no. down no. again without and, uh, asking a supplementary. No, sorry, no, no. Well, I, I think uh, <clears throat> you know. I should say uh, perhaps it should. Uh, it should be for everyone that interrupts. But apart from excuse that, excuse me a minute. It's fine. not a good thing to challenge the chair. It's not a good idea. But proceed. I'm not challenging anybody, convener. Um, <laughs> oh well. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> For, for your evidence and uh, you know, listening to uh, the projects that are on board, I, I think uh, you know you're doing an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, obviously, there's questions to be raised, and I was pleased when you mentioned the fact that you're working with voluntary sectors, uh, Dr. Bernardo's in particular, who I've been along and visited uh, in regards to how they approach it and the projects they have uh, in regards to grooming uh, and young children as well. So I'm pleased to hear about that. There's just a point of clarification, and then I wanted to ask a question also. Uh, uh, MCC Graham, you mentioned the fact that um, uh, the risk of sexual harm orders and, you know, basically the 2005 Act. Uh, you wanted to put some amendments or you would like to see some amendments in that. I don't think we explored that uh, as much as perhaps we could. 
Uh, my understanding is that the three months you would like extended and the age group you would like extended to 18 and also to take in physical and psychological abuse. Now, that would be your recommendations to the committee as such, coming from the Petitions Committee. Yeah, um, so I, I don't think it's come out of the Petitions Committee. I think the, they went as far as suggesting that it might be worth uh, examining how the legislation uh, could be enhanced. Uh, and uh, these are our suggestions as to some ways of enhancing them. Um, I, mean, I haven't put a, a time limit uh, on you, you know what it should be extended from three months to. I um, understand there might be some proportionality around about that, um, but I think three months is, uh, is constraining in terms of... Uh, the point I made earlier that we seek to gather evidence about there being the potential of a crime. Sometimes that takes some time. We'll have discussions with the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. It can be the case that by the time we would get to the stage of uh, seeking an order that the three months has already passed and we haven't got any evidence of, of further reporting. There have been some instances of that. I, I think the age limit uh, I already spoke about, yeah. I, think, um, I think it does leave us in a difficult position where we know that in effect, 16, 17-year-olds uh, are treated by the law as children in many cases, um, and I think it would be consistent if that was the case in, in this particular area, especially. Um, and uh, the third point was round about the courses of conduct, which we, we did discuss earlier. Mm. Um, I, I think it's it, it's unusual um, that, that we might be in a situation where we would identify one uh, contact that we were concerned about and be in the position of needing to await a second um, to, to, to make the order, when indeed, uh, if, if we were to, to find evidence, um, in, in some cases, one sexual conduct could be evidenced as a crime, but it wouldn't be enough for an order because it wasn't two separate contacts, even of each of them we could evidence, if you see yeah. the point. So uh, I'm not sure what lay behind the legislation and, and how it was drafted in that sense, um, but, but I think it's overly restrictive. Thank you very much. That gives us something positive to, to go forward with. Uh, the other question I wanted to ask was about cross-border. Now, you mentioned, you, men you mentioned the fact that if someone you know, obviously has committed an offence here in Scotland and they move down to England, wherever, that order will carry forward with them. But if someone in Scotland committed an offence in France, then you could you know, actually do something about it if there was a jurisdiction from Scotland. If it's in England, you can't. Could you maybe elaborate on that and what could we do as a, a committee to rectify that anomaly? I think that's probably one better uh, answered by the Crown in terms of the, the, the legal position round about uh, taking a prosecution uh, yeah. rather than it, it, it doesn't limit the police investigation as such. Um, I think the Lord Advocate mentioned this the last time he um, came to give evidence, and if, if I remember correctly, and I'm sure my colleague will correct me if I'm wrong, the difficulty is with the, the cross-border provisions. Um, if somebody um, grooms in Scotland, a, a Scottish national brooms, grooms in Scotland and then goes on to commit an offence of rape, for example, in France, then in Scotland we can at the moment prosecute the grooming and the, the rape in France. However, if a Scottish national grooms in Scotland and then commits an offence of rape in England, we are unable to prosecute mm. that rape in Scotland. And that seems to us to mm. be slightly unusual, a quandary, so to speak, um, and that appears to be a loophole in the legislation which was highlighted um, on the last occasion. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that the Cabinet Secretary of Justice is talking about looking at legislation to sort out this loophole, obviously looking for a slot, uh, and I just point these two areas up where it's something practical that perhaps we yes. as a committee could, could do. We would uh, certainly yeah. certainly support that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And of course, that was good because she preempted the question that Elaine was going to ask, which is fine, because we'd noticed that that question hadn't been asked. Um, that's, that's, uh, I have no other questions. Um, nobody else grumping at me because they've slipped down any list in my head or on paper. Yes, Ms Dalrym. Sorry, could I just say, I meant to say at the beginning, um, but we went straight into questions that um, Stephen and I, uh, Mr McGowan and myself, uh, apologise for being poor replacements for um, the Lord Advocate or the Solicitor General. Poor replacements? <laughs> come, come, you protest too much. Um, you were magnificent, and in fact, you. you were far better than the Lord Advocate. We shall tell him so. <laughs> That's all the I, All I was you. going to say was if the Lord, um, if, if you wished um, one of the officers to come at a later stage, no. then unfortunately today they, they were not available um, due 
to no. prior existing commitments, but they you're looking for a round of applause. You're not going to get it. But thank you anyway. I just want to thank you very much for your evidence. Thank you, ACC Graham. Thank you. And now I, uh, we are now moving, as we agreed, into private sessions. So I'll suspend for a couple of minutes to allow the public area and witnesses to leave. Thank you.